Agnes and I were having coffee and she said, let's do something this year together. And I said, I know exactly what we should do, and that is put on a suffragette play. I knew of some of the suffragette plays from the time, and one was called How the Vote Was Won. We went down to London on the eve of the commemoration of the Parliament Act to see a play reading of this and also hear about the work of the Fawcett Society and others. We decided that we would get together a team, so Nick Murray Brown with music and Bellona Greenwood for the script. And we would work together to produce a new piece. This has been achieved and we chose five beautifully talented young girls from the area who are actresses and also two singers from Norwich, the City College there. And it's very important that the struggle and the truth about suffragists and suffragettes is told and it still has great relevance today because women were not equal in society and we still have some inequalities to master today. Um, so yeah, so we're just in the dressing room at the moment, mm -hmm. prepping prepping for our um, third show at Beckles Public Hall, and Love we've it. done a really good tech. So mm -hmm. um, the lighting looks beautiful. The lighting looks amazing. We sound great. Yeah. We've done a run through like, uh, oh. a fast track run. Hello, girls. Here are the Hello. singers. Hello, it's Rutendo and Ariana. I think it's brilliant that we were given the opportunity through Mary. Um, really wanting to celebrate the centenary. It gave us the opportunity to all come together and all do something creative. And actually the fact that all the girls had some connection, whether they live in the area now or whether they had lived here before or went to school here, they all had their own connection with Suffolk that made it um, just particularly poignant putting on a piece um, about, about such amazing women with such amazing women. And Nick, of course. <laughs> I was yes, I was asked right at the beginning by the producer and the director Mary Agnes if I'd like to. Well, we we had a meeting originally just to discuss the show, and um, when everything was put to me, my first thought was, "Well, what am I doing in it? Because I'm a bloke, <laughs> and everybody else involved with it, the producer, the director." All the actors are all women. So, uh, and, and the writer, of course, a woman as well, Bologna. And um, it, it seemed to be great for women having all, uh, you know, a, a project all, all for them and something quite exciting about an all female cast as well. I, I was really pleased actually because it was the suffragette year and I really, the centenary of the suffragettes and I really wanted to write something and Agnes, Agnes just came and asked me and um, because she'd seen work that I'd done in the past uh, so I, I, was, yeah, I was delighted and, um, and really wanted to focus on local characters so of course there's this enormously big story to be told but there's a whole secret hidden history, really, of, of local women, so... It's lovely actually to be back here because this is the first time I've come back to this room since we actually rehearsed in here and um, it was such an amazing creative time 
and it's brilliant to all be in this room surrounded by all these windows and wonderful view. It was a really magical time and the cast was so good. Um, Angeline, uh, Charlotte, Daisy, Helen, alphabetical order, Sophie, <laughs> and then to have Rutendo and Ariana as well, the two singers. I just, I thought the whole company were fantastic and so able um, with singing, with playing the drums, with dancing, with movement, uh, devising skills, they all, the collaboration was was really um, exciting because every day you came to rehearsal and you didn't know what somebody was going to come up with. When you have such an open canvas about what you can do when you're devising a piece, I think it can be hard to, to actually know where to start. And Bologna wrote some scenes and it, it took us a while to actually agree on how we wanted to move the piece forward. And in the end, because we wanted to play with music, it just it lent itself really well to being a cabaret. I think um, it, it wouldn't have been so good as a straight play and I didn't want it to feel like a period piece about the time. I wanted to bring in everything that we know now about contemporary theatre and actually have all sorts of different um, skills used to, to tell stories. So it didn't want to feel like it was a kind of drawing room piece. Um, and I think that worked really well. And so we weren't restricted. So I don't think you'd expect um, a, a title of a musical like Suffrage the Musical. So that was really interesting as well, coming up with the name Little Cabaret of Suffragette. And I was looking at those gorgeous old posters of Toulouse-Lautrec thinking and, and, and looking at the names. And there was the Little Cabaret of was quite often used. And I thought, yeah, that's really nice. So we ended up sticking to that name, the little cabaret of suffragette. What the women went through, you just wouldn't imagine. You just wouldn't associate it with a musical. I know, I know there have been musicals about serious subjects, but on the whole, you don't think well, it wasn't musical theatre. It is, like I said, it was a play with music. But actually, it kept the audience really entertained. Having, I think it's, it would be a lot for an audience to sit through because. What the women went through was so difficult. The hardship of force feeding, the police brutality. I mean, it's really heavy subjects. So to have that interspersed with light, um, light music and dance and movement. I think the audience, I have a friend who came to see it and she was just saying how she really enjoyed all those different aspects of it rather than it being, like I said before, you know, just a straight, a straight play. You'd like to be a wife, yes, happy and respected. Then this is what I suggest you do. Um, and then Angeline with her musical number, Camilla. I mean, that was fantastic. I just think so many different styles and, and all the girls as well, um, being able to play so many different characters. So I'm playing Violet as well as, yeah, lots of others. Um, She's a mill girl who um, sort of is deciding to join the suffragette movement. Been outside the prison in Ipswich. There's women right up against the walls shouting loud as anything, so those who've been took can hear them and take heart. And it's not she's not a part of it really, but she just sort of sees sees all the women and um, wishes that she could be a part of it because her life. It's not easy for her to join yeah, it. She'd have to leave her whole life, and um, <laughs> she's got a very like uh, aggressive father and that sort of thing. Um, so she can't really yeah. leave, but she does in the end, um, and she great. joins them, which is really great. Yeah. Give me the Emily Peckhurst says the government values a pane of glass more than a woman. So loads of women are smashing windows. Ooh, well, we can do that. We can smash windows. But where? Everywhere men go. Yeah, their clubs or, or the department store. There's loads of glass to break there. There's no point breaking a small window when we can go for a big one. Um, she's young, I think she's about um, 17 or so. And then, yeah, and looking after children and all that. And her mother died, um, young, working, only like 38 years old, so she's, yeah. Constable attempted to lift me off the ground with his knee. He failed, threw me into the crowd and told them to do whatever they wanted with me. Several men tried to lift my skirt. I love the way that Sophie played Asquith and... And although they're, they're sort of comic, 
but also the Home Office guys, because although it's dealing with very serious issues and a very serious history, uh, at the same time, you know, there was, there was a lot of comedy in it. There was a lot to smile about. Um, yeah, I think they, they, were, they were great men. They really made great men. For 40 years we have waited. Petitions have been signed. Meetings have been held, but failure has been the result. Why? Because the government only moves under pressure. Men, they got the vote, not by asking gently, but by alarming the legislators. We must be militant. So I play Kitty, mm -hmm. who is the leader of the bodyguard that looked after the Pankhurst, and specifically Emmeline. And uh, they were a sort of secret group of 100 women who were all trained in jiu-jitsu. I am accused of having a hard heart. How unlike a woman. But I have a woman's heart. The strongest heart. I love like a woman and I fight like a woman. They were the first women trained in martial arts in the Western world. Yeah, By right this there. little woman, literally little, she was about, what, five foot? Oh, oh my goodness. goodness, you're quite tall, aren't you? Yeah, so, um, she I know. Goodness. So, yeah, can you just imagine this and tiny And she was a bodyguard woman. as well. I know. No, well, she, no, she <laughs> taught she us. Her, she was um, oh. Sophie's character. Yeah, oh. yeah. Edith, she, Edith. she okay. taught the girls oh, how to see. defend right. themselves. We drove ambulances, flew planes with surgeons in the field. We even became police officers with powers of arrest. I am a princess. They can keep me from their calling cards and drop me from their guest list to their balls as I have found a new family. Um, so I've made a character no, of Sophia Dukeson, um, who was ooh. goddaughter to the great that? Queen Victoria. Uh, um, she yeah. was a princess that was moved to England after the great um, the British imperialism. Um, um, I've now found thieves. Well, I've got my socks, so I haven't. And I gave you a. You gave me a pair of tights. I okay. wonder if these belong to. Um, Angeline. Yeah, she's like an incredibly <laughs> strong lady. If I am not a fit person for the purpose of representation, why am I a fit person for the purpose of taxation? Um, yeah, she basically saw the what her family had lost and what had been taken from them in uh, from India, and um, realized she had to do something to change the world and. Free people, free people who have had un injustices done to them. The princess has no intention of paying any taxes at all until women are given the right to vote. They can send their bailiffs. I do not care. I will not pay. <laughs> do not let them in, Margaret. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. Like, they've taken all English seven arms. She sounds really inspiring. She is really inspiring. She's really inspiring and she doesn't get talked about a lot in the, when you talk about the suffragettes. A lot oh, of people don't actually know who she is, so oh it's quite goodness. nice to bring that story to life. No, I didn't yeah. actually know yeah. about her. Neither did I. Beforehand. Mm. Neither did I. It's so amazing the things that she's done. Yeah. My godmother, Queen Victoria, abhors the fight for votes. Yet she was a woman who ruled with the strength and acuity of any man. Is she from around here? Yeah, so she, well, she was from Punjab originally. But, um, oh, wow. Yeah, um, but lived in Elverdon Hall, grew up in Elverdon Hall, which is in Suffolk. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, so lovely, yeah. And her father Hi. built it. Um, if there's another thing to highlight, um, again, it was a departure from the sorts of songs that I usually write, was one, a theme song for one of the characters, Sophia Dulip Singh, who was born in Norfolk originally. I mean, she, she lived in London. Um, and using, trying to, to figure out how to get an Indian rhythm into, into this song, uh, I found it absolutely fascinating. I mean, I, I don't know how, how successful it was because a lot of it I, I had to do digitally because obviously I, I don't have acoustic Indian instruments or any kind of ethnic instruments really. Um, 
so it was a mixture of using again using live instruments and just fiddling and overlaying digital sounds to try and create the sound I wanted. Uh, I really enjoyed doing that, and that ended up being a it was it was turned into a video. <laughs> surprisingly not my idea <laughs> uh, but it, it became a, um, a video and this lovely dance um, performed by Daisy who wore this uh, be beautiful costume and did this absolute fabulous dance so that was a nice highlight of the show that held such steal me way up my size so I play multiple characters in the show. I'd say that the main historical character that I play is Millicent Fawcett. Another letter, Mrs Fawcett. There isn't a day when there isn't a letter. And not just one or two. I keep the post office in business. She was a suffragist. Um, she kind of started the whole movement, um, which then the suffragette movement came from. and. Uh, yeah, she's a really interesting character. She actually is from Suffolk. She grew up in Oldborough, um, which is uh, something I learnt during this production. You are the youngest, so you must get us the boat. <laughs> Who would have thought that this would be my life struggle? Elizabeth became the first woman doctor in England. Emily founded Girton College, Cambridge. And me? Well, here we are, still fighting. Um, yeah, I play her, you see her at different times in the show. At the beginning, she's confronting uh, the, prime, the Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith. Um, and she's pretty ballsy, she, she knows what she wants. Um, she wants the vote, but she has so much to deal with and you see the stress that she's under being the kind of leader of this organisation. And then when you see her again, she's a lot older. Um, and also you get to see her reaction to the suffragettes and the violence that that they are um, using to try and get as a tactic and also the violence that is inflicted upon them in prison. And she's just like, no, 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 don't like violence. I want it to be peaceful. I sing a song called Peaceful People, which represents her um, feelings about that. Um, yeah, so she wanted to be lawful about everything. Well, we, we are law abiding suffragists, but, but this, th this perpetual cycle of torture Um, another character I really enjoy is um, a character called Giles. He's fictionalised, but he is uh, he represents the male um, po politician of agenda of the time, and he is a massive misogynist. Um, and I really, really hype it up. I mean, to be honest, it's probably how they were and how some men are today. But um, yeah, those scenes are really are funny. I can see the Home Secretary squall on it. Oh, it was his bloody fault. We're in this mess in the first place. We had to release all the militants of that church. And I get to express myself in different ways. I do a contemporary dance uh, at one point, um, which happens after a force feeding scene. Um, so as an actress, it's quite nice just to like release everything after that. <laughs> Okay, so I play a range of different characters in the play, um, I think up to about 13 or 14 different characters, I'm not sure, um, uh, so it's a lot of fun uh, doing multi-rolling, uh, it's quite hectic backstage, you know, doing costume changes and things like that, but um, my main character is Camilla, the musical girl, and she has a lovely big number at the beginning of Act 2. Woo! Now on my 18th birthday, my father brought me to his my dear, he said, you can't go on like this unless you want to be an eternal miss, a predicament that's anything but funny. She's not only doing it for herself, but she's doing it for her mum. I just mean, I'm not afraid if that's what you think. No, that's not what I think. And if you must know, we're all scared. We all know the risks. But I'm just worried about my mum. Which I think is a really important message because 
um, the suffragettes and suffragists were doing it not just for themselves but for every woman. But you know that your sister is in the cell next door and the one after that one and the one after that and side by side. <laughs> Before rehearsals even started, I think a lot of us um, really delved ourselves into research, into really um, knowing the ins and outs of what happened to the suffragettes or, and suffragists inside prison and um, the, the conditions that they were in and what they had to face. How many times were you forced there? 292 times. Sometimes it was four times a day. You know, I what one of our local a local women, so one of our, our local women, two hundred and ninety-two times. It's just imagining having that done to you. I couldn't bear that nothing was properly sterilized. I saw where they kept the stuff when they dragged me from my cell past the trolley. Not one single woman on hunger strike gave in. And they would also go on thirst strike as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite extraordinary the, you know, the, the determination and the courage that they had, and and the fact that it's so little known about, and the extent that they were force fed. It's really interesting to know that the writer Bologna, she actually told us that um, not a single suffragette um, said no to force feeding. They all went along with it, which I think is incredible. Not a single person, not a single female was documented to say no to force feeding. One of the things that I really enjoyed as a director was thinking about how to put something like force feeding on the stage, because I didn't want it to be naturalistic. Obviously, you know, you're sitting there watching, you've got tubes and the sound, and obviously if you think of it all, um, it can make you feel quite sick. So in the end, having a still image, I think worked really well. And the girls worked so well together on devising those images. We could have used many that they came up with, but I'd seen one picture where a suffragette's head was back and they were actually shoving the tube down her. And that image stayed with me. And then in, in the actual piece, Helen's hands were just sort of twitching. That was the only bit of movement. And a lot of people said that that image was very, very striking. Uh, the whole thing about the hunger strikes, because that was a very powerful part of the play, I think. And I think the direction, the way of staging it was was fantastic. Yeah. Because it's such a difficult thing to, to put across. Yes, I'm a bird. I'm free. Oh wow! Yeah, so we're all free. Because it really worked really like a bird. Scene, didn't yeah. It? When they left, was it when they left prison? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about them being free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> About okay, the first one was there, yeah, and it, um, it's about like your heart. Uh, don't let your heart rot because you've been through such painful things. a song I did, uh, Lord Don't It Make Your Daughter Cry. So it was, a, it was a gospel type song and that meant a lot to me as, as one of the more serious songs because I was trying to say, I mean hopefully um, effectively but simply, a song that represented the difficulties that, uh, that these women suffered. The 
there needed to be more research, more, more women's stories written down, frankly. So, uh, so I did have to imagine. But, but all the stories in there are based on testimony. Actually, uh, there was a great resource that was the BBC who had recorded uh, interviews with suffragettes and suffragists. And that, that made something of, a, of an archive, a BBC archive. And I, I listened to as much as I could. Wow, was that much later when they were older, you know, yeah. 50s or something? They, they were older women and it was like capturing some of their experiences before they died. Probably the parts in the play where the women are giving testimony to how they've been treated, I think those are the most, those are definitely the most powerful moments for me in the, in the way that the, it's been directed and put together. And the, and the commitment from the actresses, the way that they've, they've sort of, um, they've been, you know, putting forth the words of the women, and from the time, you know, a lot, a lot of the speeches, a lot, a lot of what's written has, you know, were, were things that women said. But um, what's also really interesting about it is that, uh, you know, the women hunger struck, and that that actually inspired other other revolutionaries or other people involved in struggle who were in prison to hunger strike as well. So it was through their example that, uh, you know, other people picked it up. It hadn't really been something that was done before, not on this the sort of scale that, that the suffragettes um, did it. Oh yeah. Um, anyway, and, and they suffered, you know, they suffered afterwards. There, there were real, so there were health consequences uh, to, to what they went through. Uh, and sadly it worked. And in a way it's really interesting because it's a violence in a sense that's visited upon the female body and uh, it was something that they, you know, it was the last territory, it was the last thing they had. It's almost like um, uh, sometimes in any kind of struggle, all that you're left with, everything is taken from you, but all you have left is your dignity and your body to do with as you, you know, as you choose. So... Now, it's always exciting when you see your words given another dimension. <laughs> they're sort of fleshed out and they're given life. So um, I was excited. I was really moved. And obviously I knew the script well, so for me to be moved, that was... Some, some of it was very moving. I'd say my... It's hard to say if you've got a favourite character because... Um, so I, lo I love Violet, who's the, you know, the working-class girl. And I loved writing that. And but you know, I, I love my policeman. I really did like it. Um, and I and the for, for the comedy point of view, I, I just loved the Home Office guys. Uh, the, you know, the misogyny against women was enormous, especially in Westminster. Uh, so it wasn't just it was patronising. There was a uh, there was a, a sort of an apocryphal story which I didn't put in the play, but I I wish I could have done. And that was that after um, war had broken out, the women who had been so organised, so were so ready to be a part of the war movement and everything, they went to the um, they went to the Admiralty. I think it was yeah the Admiralty to offer their services, and the uh, whoever they were speaking to at the time just said, um, uh, "No, thank you." Basically, "No, thank you, ladies. Just um, sit down, ladies." Go home and sit. That's what ladies do. Um, I had two roles in the play. I was producer. And the other role was um, my love of costume. So I looked at lots of pictures and photographs of the time. And I looked in museums as well. And got a really good uh, feel for the flavour of the costume for the day. The Victorian, very, very constricted bustle and um, bodice had rather disappeared. And clothes were becoming more flowing, but still very long and still covering most of the female body. And the colours that the suffragettes chose were purple, white and green. And in lots of their marches, you would see them in white from head to foot. One other thing was they told all the women from whatever class they were that they were to wear their very best on their marches 
and to be seen to be wearing their best in all public venues. This I tried to do in the play and the end of the play you have very decorated hats with the colours green, white and purple and the girls all in white. Costumes, Mary, I mean Mary, everyone was so capable I think Mary would just went off and did her own thing. Would People would go off, find things and come back and it was, I thought it was a really successful team effort and I thought the girls looked amazing. It made it hard because I think it was almost, the costumes were good enough to be in a film but they had to get changed really quickly and actually Ariana and Rutendo were fantastic at linking those moments together which became the difficulty of getting out of a costume and into a different costume very very quickly gave us the opportunity to do some really creative work with Rutendo and Ariana and I really liked the linking bits that they did. Nick's music was absolutely beautiful and also Nick didn't want to be restricted in the music to having just songs from the period which I think was brilliant mm. so that so that we did have the Andrews sisters style one and the gospel one um, and the, the songs worked really well. I thought with all the songs the actors did so well it was really good because um, fabulous to write and have an opportunity to write an, an original musical because we had looked at some extant stuff which I'm glad we agreed not to do and stuck to doing everything original. It, it changed an awful lot from the first meeting to how the show eventually ended up. Our first ideas were very surreal we wanted quite a wacky kind of way of looking at the theme of the suffragettes and suffragists, but at the same time being sincere to things that mattered. So have a, have a sort of a, a mix. That element subsided and we went more into a cabaret style feel for the show. And then I got cracking writing the songs, which were a result of getting ideas from everybody. Uh, the writer, uh, Valona, Agnes and Mary, and I chipped in a few ideas myself. None of which were taken up. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> writing the musical, um, first of all what I did was look up a load of stuff online just for myself, just to get a feel of some of the subject matter and um, basically noting down sometimes just words or sentences or something that I thought would kick off a song. So it was a mixture of knowing roughly what I was talking about from what I'd picked up on my research and then hopefully using a bit of my own imagination, limited as it is. But that's how I went about it. Mary who first suggested the song, a song about smashing in windows, because that's an event which we knew the suffragettes did to get attention. The shattering of the smashing windows gives you such a kick. Um, I, I enjoyed doing fun songs, which is great. And then there were two or three occasions in the play when a more serious song was used and this was basically from the reality that suffragists, suffragettes went through and this was what I read up myself and looking at interviews and there are one or two documentaries on telly which I watched 
And this was the incredible suffering that they went through, which I had no idea about. Like a lot of people, it was mainly the kind of propaganda stuff that's been shown over and over again on telly, like them being chained to the railings, which is only a sort of like a publicity thing, which, which I learned. And of course, the famous tragedy when Emily was run over by a horse when she tried to pin a banner on the horse. Um, but looking deeper into it, it's the incredible suffering that the women had and believing what they did, the fact that they they weren't just doing it, um, I mean, they were risking their lives because they were, they were risking being put into prison. The show is very physical and there's a lot of singing involved as well. So um, in order for us to prepare for, for that, we had to build up a lot of stamina throughout rehearsals. We had lovely um, voice and singing workshops with Nick to go over the songs so we can really prepare for those. Gecko came to do a workshop with us, which was absolutely amazing. Um, Helen um, from Gecko, she, her energy and what she got out of the girls was absolutely incredible. So we were able to use a lot of the work they did with her in more than one place, actually. There's a slow motion bit with Angeline, Sophie and Charlotte. There was the bit with Christabel and the newspapers, the newspaper men on Christabel's escaping to Paris. That, that they developed that with, with Gecko. Um, and there's also a bit which I particularly like, uh, which Sophie um, helped devise. It was the movement piece, um, com talking about police brutality when they were all on the chairs. And that was inspired by DV8 and a, a chair piece that I'd seen that they had done. And I think that I loved the bit at the beginning where um, the girls were in prison, it was a voiceover. And so it just sort of set the mood and they'd done some solo pieces with Gecko, which they which we used in that section. And then very quickly it went out of that, you know, a snap of light and the side lights coming on and all of a sudden the girls had top hats. And I loved that first song, really unexpected, going from something dark. And so the so the mood of the cha the, the mood of the show changed so quickly from one thing to another. And I, that I really enjoyed that. So with very little, in fact, mostly lighting and costume, um, and then maybe a bit of music or a movement or an attitude in the actor, you managed to, to create a completely different atmosphere. And I thought that was really exciting. When I was researching before we actually started rehearsals, I found a, a painting by John Steer, and it, it, it's got this wonderful, wonderful colours, like pink and yellow. And I wanted something to suggest um, the seaside in Albra around that period when he would have painted it, 1908. And, um, and so I talked to um, Josh, who did our lighting, about splitting the, uh, the, the stage in two. So, so we had a flood of pink and a flood of yellow. And also we had the idea of using a fan um, and I wanted this, that just the vision of Angeline and, and Charlotte and Helen with sort of playing in Albra as younger Millicent um, and her sister and a friend, Emily. And um, uh, and I think that, that with Nick's music as well and Sophie and Daisy just simply with their envelopes as the seagulls and that, that created that mood. Um, also, the, the, the several times there was... A, a blue light which flooded the stage and I think having those intense colours when a lot of it is a sharply contrasted black and white all of a sudden get a flood of colour it does immediately impact you especially if it's set with a certain uh, a certain piece of music um, yeah it's magical I was really delighted when Agnes actually asked me to be a part of this and Mary um, because it's bringing, bringing me back to my roots in Suffolk. This is where I was born and bred. And I, I was really surprised with how uneducated I was on the suffragettes and suffragists here. 
um, like Millicent Fawcett was from Albra and there were so many interesting documented historical events that happened here in Suffolk to do with the suffragettes, you know, setting fire to the uh, Galston Pier, Great Yarmouth Pier uh, and things like that. So, uh, you know, it was really interesting to sort of educate myself on that. The difficulty, there was a difficulty in that actually uh, what local women did, women weren't written about, you know, their words weren't recorded. So there was, you know, there, there wasn't very much to read or there would be snippets or there'd be a little bit in a local newspaper archive. But actually, um, the lives of the women weren't necessarily written down. Uh, I did use, I uh, come across a fantastic book and I've completely forgotten the, uh, the title of it. I, it was called Suffragette. And it was like a compilation of writing from the time. Uh, so there'd be bits of Hansard, there would be um, uh, bits in it about, uh, you know, the, the opposition to the women, um, some letters, you know, it, it was a great resource. It still wasn't local, but it, it sort of pointed the way. I did loads of internet research, but, you know, it, was, it would all be very general. I looked in archives, um, uh, you know, Westminster for the political stuff, um, Hansard. Um, I looked in, I can't, I did look in, there was a feminist library, I looked in, I mean, lots of different places, and then just pieced things together. To help promote the play, um, the producer, Mary, and I uh, went to the Honey Bee Cafe in Lowestoft, uh, where the suffragists actually held their um, society meetings, and it then progressed to be the suffragettes, uh, the more mi militant side. But um, their, their vintage tea rooms um, is a beautiful place um, to go, and there's a beautiful photograph that they actually have from 1910 of all the suffragists lined up outside the shop um well what was back then the the society uh, club um building so th that was lovely to see and just all these little things just add so much texture to to my performance knowing all these extra little things so and one of the great things was finding um the meeting house in Lowestoft Honey Bees Cafe and actually thinking you know a hundred years ago women like us would attend these meetings regu regularly in order to create some incredible change and sometimes we think oh what's the point of this what's the point of that and yet of course there's a point to what we do and the fact that they made such efforts um I think what was great in Bologna's research and with Mary's intention to have the piece set um, in well about these suffragettes who lived in Suffolk because we all know about national suffragettes but actually we didn't know that much about Sophia Dilip Singh, uh, Millicent Fawcett being from Al Albra, Sophia lived in Elverton Hall um, and it was it was just brilliant to find out more about local suffragettes and suffragists because uh, these, this, there are so many, obviously, so many sto stories of untold women and the sacrifices that they made, and I think it does make it more personal. It was, it was a fantastic collaboration. It really was, and it, and it really mattered that everyone cared so much about the material. So a great experience. You never forget something like that. I think when you have a really special time, I think it stays with you for years. Let's hear it.